Equalization, or EQ, is the single most powerful tool you have for shaping the sound of your dialogue. But every voice is unique, and every recording space has its own sound. That's why you can't rely on a one-size-fits-all approach. It's not about memorizing magic numbers or using generic presets. This video is your guide to thinking like a professional audio engineer. And by the end, you'll have a complete, repeatable workflow to make any dialogue sound clear, natural, and polished using the powerful tools right inside DaVinci Resolve. The process really breaks down into two distinct phases. First, we've got the corrective EQ. This is where we try and clean up any nasty parts of the audio recording and remove distracting problems. Second, we have enhancement EQ. Once the audio is cleaned up, we start shaping the tone to add warmth, clarity, and that professional polish to help the voice sit perfectly in the mix. But before we master this two-phase approach, we need to understand the material we're working with, the human voice itself. Think of the entire range of human hearing as a spectrum, from about 20 hertz on the low end to 20,000 hertz or 20 kilohertz on the high end. An equalizer is just a tool that lets us turn specific parts of that up and down. A human voice is made up of two key things. First, you've got a fundamental frequency. This is the basic pitch of the voice. For a typical male, it's down here around 90 to 155 hertz. For a female, it's about an octave higher, around 165 to 255 hertz. This range gives the voice its body and its weight. Second, and most importantly, are the harmonics. These are the multiples of that fundamental frequency at higher pitches. The harmonics are what give a voice its unique character, and most importantly, its intelligibility, the quality that makes it understandable. In fact, the consonants that form our words are mostly found in the mid and high frequencies, from around 2000 to 4000 hertz. That's why you can still understand someone talking on an old telephone, even though the phone cuts out the low fundamental frequencies entirely. So when we EQ, we have to manage the relationship between the fundamental frequency for body and the harmonics for clarity. To do that, let's define a shared vocabulary and describe the different parts of the spectrum, so you can translate what you're hearing into a frequency that you can adjust. Now to begin with, we've got rumble, which sits kind of below 80 to 100 hertz. This isn't your voice, it's traffic, and it's mic bumps or air conditioning noises. It just kind of wastes energy and makes things muddy. Then we've got boom or body from 100 to 250 hertz. This is where the fundamental frequency lives, but too much volume here can sound a little bit boomy, like you've got a head cold. Next, we've got muddiness or boxiness around the 250 to 600 hertz. This is the number one problem area. Too much of this makes a voice sound muffled and unclear, like it was recorded in a cardboard box. Then we've got nasality, or for want of a better word, honk, in the 600 hertz to the 1.5 kilohertz range. Just what it sounds like, as if someone's talking through their nose. Up next, we've got presence and clarity from 1.5 to 5 kilohertz. This is the magic zone for intelligibility. Our ears are the most sensitive to this range, but be careful, too much volume here can sound really harsh and really aggressive. Then we have sibilance in this 5 to 8 kilohertz range. This is where those sharp S's and T's live. Boosting here can be a bit painful. And finally, we've got air or sparkle in the 8 to 20 kilohertz range. This adds sort of a sheen and a sense of openness to the voice. So keep these ranges in mind, because we're going to move on to our strategic workflow here in a second, but I've got one quick tangent I want to go on first. You see, the process of equalization doesn't actually begin in post-production. It begins with the choice and the placement of the microphone you've got on set. You see, every microphone works the same way. It's a transducer that converts acoustic energy into an electrical signal, but no microphone ever does that perfectly. Every model is going to have its own sort of inherent frequency response. It's going to react to sharp sounds differently and loud sounds differently, and you'll hear differences in what's called off-axis coloration, which means how it captures sound from the sides versus the front. Think about a lavalier microphone that's taped to a person's chest. It's going to naturally capture more of that low-mid chest resonance. And a shotgun microphone that's boomed from overhead is going to capture a different balance of direct sound and room reflections. Sometimes you might hear someone say, oh, that microphone takes EQ really well. That means it's got a smooth frequency response, so it doesn't have any sharp, narrow peaks or dips. These kind of peaks are something called inherent resonances. When an audio engineer boosts a frequency range in a microphone in a spot that's got a resonance like that, that peak is exaggerated and you can get really harsh or really unnatural sound. So selecting a microphone that's well suited to the specific voice and the specific recording environment is the most powerful EQ move you can make. It shrinks the amount of heavy-handed corrective EQ you're going to need to do in post-production. All right, end of tangent, let's get on with the workflow. Now, amateurs, they hunt around tweaking knobs until something sounds a bit different. Professionals use a system. That system is built on a few core principles. Now, the first, as we mentioned, is the two-phase approach. We always do corrective work first and enhancement work second. But there's one thing I want you to remember. You've got to mix in context. 
Now, context is such an important topic. I actually made a whole video about it and I'm going to link to that below. But in this case, I just want you to remember that it's this huge, huge mistake to EQ your dialogue with the solo button turned on. A voice that sounds perfect by itself could become completely buried the moment you add music and sound effects. This is because of something called auditory masking. When two sounds occupy the same frequency range, the louder sound can partially or completely obscure the quieter one. A dialogue track that sounds perfectly balanced in solo might become completely unintelligible when you turn some music on. A subtractive EQ cut that sounds subtle in solo might cause the voice to vanish completely once you bring in the rest of the mix. So just remember to treat the solo button as a diagnostic tool. Use it to find a problem, but make that final adjustment with the full mix playing. Now in this tutorial, I'm deliberately not going to have any other audio going on just so it's crystal clear what changes I'm making when I'm moving things around. But unless you're actually just mixing a podcast or something where there's nothing going on other than somebody talking, I just want you to make sure you're listening to your whole mix. All right, now let's get our hands dirty and start the corrective process. The way I like to work is applying EQ at the track level rather than on a clip by clip basis. I'll put all the audio from the same person on the same track and then all the clips are affected in the same way. Each audio track you create already has an EQ effect available. If you're on the Fairlight page, you can access it by opening up the mixer panel and double clicking on the EQ. You can also access it on the cut and edit pages. If you open the mixer panel, right at the top, you'll see a little EQ button. You can click that and it's gonna launch in a separate floating window, just like in Fairlight. The first thing you'll wanna do on virtually every dialogue track is apply a high pass filter. This filter cuts out all the low frequency noise that isn't part of the human voice, and lets the higher frequency noise pass through. In the EQ window, band one is already a high pass filter by default, so we're gonna turn that on. A common method to use it is to sweep until it thins the voice out and then back off. I'll start with the frequency control way down low and slowly sweep it up while I listen. I'm listening for the exact point where the voice starts to lose its body and sound weak. Let's start with intra frame compression. You might hear it referred to as all I or all intra. The term intra means within. In an intra frame codec, every single frame of video is compressed and stored as a complete self contained image. For a male voice, you usually land between 80 and 120 hertz. For a female voice, you can often go a little bit higher, like 100 to 150 hertz. Now we've removed all the useless rumble without hurting the voice. Now we're going to hunt for those ugly resonances in the mids, the muddiness, the boxiness, the nasality. We use a technique called boost, sweep, cut. Let's grab a band and make sure it's a bell filter. Now do something that feels really wrong. Boost the gain way, way up, and then crank the Q factor to a high number, making it a really narrow band. Now we'll sweep the frequency control through some of the regions we discussed. I'm listening for a frequency that just jumps out and sounds awful. Like you've been shooting on film. Each frame of film is a self-contained image. If you want to look at frame 15, you just go to frame 15. Simple. Some examples of codecs that use this you might have heard of include Apple ProRes and Avid DNX HR. Because each frame is complete and self-contained, it makes... There's one. Now I'll switch the gain from big boost to a cut. We'll start with like minus 4 dB. Now we'll repeat this process with another band to find any kind of nasal or honky sounds or any harsh piercing tones we want to get rid of. Pay close attention for any frequency that suddenly jumps out from the rest of the audio. It might sound like a whistle, a ringing tone, or kind of an ugly resonant honk. That's a problem frequency. Scrubbing through the timeline buttery smooth, but depending on the format, file sizes can be on the large size. Let's start with intraframe compression. You might hear it referred to as all I or all intra. And with that done, now we enter into phase two. For enhancement, when we add frequencies, we want to use a wide bandwidth, which means a low Q factor, and try and make a broad, gentle, musical sounding change. Narrow boosts almost always sound weird and unnatural. If the high pass filter made the voice a little too thin, we can add some weight back. I'll grab a band, set it to a wide Q, and add a very gentle boost of maybe 1 or 2 dB, somewhere in the 120 to 250 range. Too much is just going to introduce boominess. This should always be subtle. Let's start with intraframe compression. You might hear it referred to as all I or all intra. The term intra means within. In an intraframe codec, the 2 to 5 kHz range is key for clarity and making a voice cut through a busy mix. A wide gentle boost here can bring a voice from the background right to the foreground. Use another band, give it a wide Q, and sweep a 2 dB boost through this range to find a sweet spot that adds intelligibility without making it harsh. Because this range is a double-edged sword. It's the home of clarity, but it's also the home of harshness. If a voice is already harsh, boosting here will make it worse. Sometimes the pro move is to actually make a small cut in the harshest spot, and then we'll add air later on to compensate. Every single frame of video is compressed and stored as a complete self-contained image. Think of it like you've been shooting on film. Each frame of film is a self-contained image. If you want to look at frame 15, you just go to frame 15. Simple. For that final professional polish, we'll use a high shelf boost. I'll enable band 6 and change its filter type to a high shelf. This lifts all the frequencies above a certain point. 
A gentle lift somewhere around 8 to 12k could add a sense of openness and detail like lifting a blanket off the microphone. Don't overdo it or you'll exaggerate hiss and make the voice sound brittle. Some examples of codecs that use this you might have heard of include Apple ProRes and Avid DNX HR. Because each frame is complete and self-contained, it makes scrubbing through the timeline buttery smooth. But depending on the format, file sizes can be on the large size. And now let's do the most critical check, A-B testing with gain matching. See, when you bypass the EQ, depending on how much you've cut or you've boosted, you might hear a change in volume. To do a fair comparison, adjust the track's output gain so the volume is the same whether the EQ is on or off. This defeats the louder is better illusion and lets you judge your changes more honestly. Let's start with intraframe compression. You might hear it referred to as all I or all intra. Let's start with intraframe compression. You might hear it referred to as all I or all intra. The term intra means within. In an intraframe codec, every single frame of video is compressed and stored as a complete self-contained image. Think of it like you've been shooting on film. Each frame of film is a self-contained image. If you want to look at frame 15, you just go to frame 15. Now don't forget, EQ is the star, but it works as part of a team. A typical audio chain in Fairlight might look something like this. EQ first, then if adding presence and air made the S sounds too sharp, you could add a DS of Fairlight plugin after the EQ to tame them. And then you can add a compressor using the track's built-in dynamics processor to even out the volume levels and help ensure every word is clearly heard. It's important to use compression after you've made the EQ changes. Why? If you have a bunch of low-end rumble in your track, that rumble is going to trick the compressor into working overtime and it will start clamping down in your audio because of a problem you plan to remove anyway. By removing the unwanted sounds first with the EQ, the compressor is only going to react to the actual dynamics of the clean voice, giving you much more control. Now, I want you to know that working with audio and resolve is not without its problems. One issue is that the built-in EQ only has six bands. If you've got more than six tweaks you want to make, then that can be a problem. One option is to use an EQ effect that has more bands available. I'm a big fan of Shape It from Soundly, which I'll leave a link to in the description. You can add 10 EQ bands on that one. Now, to be clear, this isn't a sponsored post or anything, and they have no idea who I am or that I'm mentioning them. I just think it's a great plugin, and I'm shocked it's free. Here's another approach. I've heard some audio engineers that swear by doing corrective EQ first, then compression, and then enhancement EQ after with a second EQ. But in Resolve, you start to run into problems with the order in which effects are introduced. You see, if we look at the mixer on the Fairlight page, you can see that the work you're doing is being applied in a particular order, shown here, and you can change it any time. By default, it's applying effects first, then dynamics, then EQ. You can click on that list and change the order. If you set it to EQ, then dynamics, then effects, the compressor is indeed applied after the EQ. But what if I want to apply corrective EQ first, and then an effect from one of these repair tools from Isotope before the compressor, and then another EQ effect after the compressor to do some enhancement? I, I can't. The Resolve Mixer doesn't allow me to place effects in two different parts of the signal chain. It also means you can't place a dynamics panel between effects that you've added to your signal. There are some workarounds. There's a multiband compressor effect you could use, but that works a little bit differently to the single band one in the dynamics panel. There's a compressor that's part of the dialogue processor effect, but it doesn't have anywhere near the control you get from the dynamics panel. There's another built-in effect called vocal channel that has a compressor in it as well. But I really do wish they would make where you put things in the signal chain way more flexible. Now, while I did say there isn't a one-size-fits-all approach that works every time, if you find a setting you love for a particular person and microphone where that situation stays consistent, like a voiceover booth or a podcast setup, you can save it as a preset right from the EQ window and use it again later, so that can be a huge time saver. Before we wrap up, we're going to bust a couple of myths and we're going to highlight a critical pitfall. Myth number one, you should only ever cut, never boost. You're going to see that everywhere online. The idea that subtractive EQ is inherently superior to additive EQ is nonsense. This cut-only philosophy has its roots in two contexts. The analog era, where boosting frequencies also boosted the noise floor of the equipment, and then a well-intentioned but kind of misguided attempt to avoid that louder is better psychoacoustic trap. In the digital world, subtractive and additive EQ are equally valid tools. You use cutting to fix problems and boosting to enhance qualities. Refusing to boost is like a carpenter refusing to use a hammer. Myth number two. EQ will fix my bad recording. Uh, no, no it won't. EQ is a shaping tool, not a creation tool. It can only cut or boost frequencies that are already there. The quality of the source audio is and always will be the most important factor in the final result. EQ is for polishing a good recording, not for turning a bad recording into a good one. Now there are some amazing AI power tools these days that can work miracles. If you go to podcast.adobe.com, They've got an enhanced speech tool that saved me on more than one occasion by making something recorded for an interview over Zoom with a crappy sounding webcam sound so much better. This is the sound that comes from the microphone built into my webcam. But when I press the button, 
this AI software does an amazing job of making it sound slightly more professional. And finally, the biggest pitfall, overprocessing. The goal is subtle improvement. If your dialogue starts to sound thin or hollow or just plain weird, you've gone too far. Constantly use that bypass button to compare your work to the original. Often, the best EQ is the EQ you don't notice. So in conclusion, remember EQ is a two-step process. First, be a surgeon. Use subtractive EQ like a high-pass filter and narrow cuts to clean up the audio. Second, be a sculptor. Use additive EQ with wide, gentle boosts to enhance the voice, adding body and presence and air. Always make your decisions in the context of the full mix and constantly use that bypass button to stay objective. Now this only gets easier with deliberate practice. Use this workflow, experiment on your own voice and train your ears to hear all of these frequency characteristics we've been talking about. Soon, this process is gonna become intuition and you'll be able to approach any dialogue track with total confidence. If you've got any questions, drop them in the comments. I will do my best to get you an answer. While you're down there, be sure to give this video a like to help other people find it. And be sure to subscribe to make sure you don't miss out on any other Resolve tips and tricks just like these. Thanks so much for watching. I'll see you in the next one.